Mark chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 35 and read over to verse 39. Let us not forget our responsive reading. Grass with us and the flowers fade, but the word of our God, so good. Join me there in verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us today. I pray for your sons and daughters here that are trying to live spiritually on what they get on Sunday by Sunday. God, I pray that from your word and by the example of your son Jesus, that you would call people to a deep and abiding fellowship, that it would start today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. There is not a person in this room that does not have some sort of demand or expectation on you in your life. Oftentimes the demands or expectations that are on you in your life right now are causing tremendous pressure. For some of you, that pressure is extreme. For a few of you, that pressure is unsustainable. When that kind of pressure is on you, and it may be unavoidable for some of you, when that kind of pressure is on you, something inevitably suffers. What, what suffers when you get busy? What do you put down so that you can pick something else up? How are you even making it work? And can you truthfully say that you are maintaining a vibrant fellowship with God? We're on the front end of the Gospel of Mark. If you're a visitor, that's where we are. We're going through Mark. This is the eighth sermon in Mark. And as Christians, we have very specific things that we believe about Jesus in order to actually be Christians. For instance, we believe in the substitutionary life and death of Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. As Christians, we believe that God created Adam and Eve. Adam, the first man, was created to be in perfect fellowship with God. He sinned. He and, Adam, he and Eve both sinned, fell away from fellowship with God. It's broken. The second Adam, Jesus, came to live as a man, as a substitute for us. He lived perfectly, kept all of God's laws, and as our substitute, he lived a perfectly righteous life. But that's not all he did. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Here's the gospel. Wages of sin is death. Therefore, Jesus took all that we deserve. That's why we have the cross. As our substitute, he died on the cross in our place as a substitute. That is a basic Christian belief about Jesus. That's not all we believe, though. We believe that he is our mediator, that God raised him from the dead on the third day, on a Sunday. It's why we worship on a Sunday. God raised him from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God and there he intercedes for us. We have access to God because of what Jesus has done for us. That's not all we believe about Jesus though. We believe that he has a threefold office, that he is prophet and priest and king. As our prophet, we hear what he says, we believe it and act on what the Lord Jesus has said. As our priest, we trust in his sacrifice on our behalf to give us fellowship with God. As our king, we bow our lives before him, devoting ourselves to him. That's not all we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, that there is no other name given on earth 
to men whereby we can be saved. We believe that the only way that you can actually have fellowship with God is through faith in what Christ has done for you on the cross. We believe that He is Lord, that, that as Lord we bow our lives, we commit ourselves to, to full obedience to Jesus. That's what Christians believe, but that's not all we believe. On top of all of that, we actually believe that Jesus is our example. That's what we have in the text in front of us. I want you to learn more than just the orthodoxy of who he is. I want us to learn today from his life. And there's a lesson in here that every one of us here, every single one of us needs. Join me in the context. In the context, what's happened in chapter 1 is Jesus and his friends, who are James and John and Simon and Andrew, they have gone to the synagogue in Capernaum. There at the synagogue, Jesus cast out a demon, and he taught. And then after that, they walked over to Simon's house to get some lunch, like you would after church. And there, um, Simon's, Simon's mother-in-law was sick. He healed her. People heard about that. She served them. They ate. That night when the sun went down, the Sabbath is over, you can move freely. People came to the yard, wanting to be healed. Who knows how many people were there? They were there late into the night. You ever had people come to your house and just won't leave? <laughs> you do. You send every message and body signal and walk around, maybe circle the table, um, get up and sit back down, get up and sit back down. You got kids, you'll bathe them two or three times, you get, send the message. <laughs> so the people stayed all night. People are being healed. Who knows? Luke says he healed everybody there. They stayed all night there. How long they stayed, we don't know. How late the night was, we don't know. But in our passage, what we see is after a terribly long night, Jesus sacrificing sleep. Look, if anybody deserved to sleep in, Jesus did. But right here in Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 39, what we have in front of us is a very rare glimpse into the spiritual life, the private spiritual life of Jesus. And what we see there is his fellowship with the Father and how his fellowship with the Father made him ready for all that was in front of him the very next day. Now, brothers and sisters, if a perfect, sinless Jesus needed time alone with God the Father, then certainly you and I do as well. I want you to be spiritually strong. I want you to be biblically informed. I want you to be fully prepared. I want you to be able to walk into a world that's hostile and sinful and an environment that you live in where people don't believe like you do and think what you believe is ludicrous. I want you to be able to walk into that strong. That strength comes from life with Jesus. Today I hope to convince you that life with Jesus is the life we need. Life with Jesus is the life we need. I have two points here. Uh, one point has seven or eight subpoints, but but it's just one point, and then the second point will be at the very end. Let's join the first one. Here it is. Number one, we need time with God. You need time with God. After a long draining night and an emotionally draining night, what did Jesus do? Verse 35, and rising very early in the morning. While it was still dark, he departed, went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. There are some times when you don't have to put forth the effort, when the Spirit of God is moving in such a way that it goes beyond explanation. You, might, you may have heard what's going on in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury College. Christian college, it seems as if there is this movement, this awakening with students, and they've been worshiping for about four or five, ten days now. It's really something. But that's, that's not something that happens all the time. We, we pray for that, but what we know is that God has given us some very ordinary things, like Sunday morning, ordinary means of grace, 
like a time of devotion when you are alone with God. And here in this passage, we have been given a beautiful example of how we can be strong in the Lord each day. What then, what then do we need? What do we need to do? I'd like to give action steps. Number one, you've got to act. You've got to do something. You can't sit back. When you read verse 35, and you can read it, you see four action verbs. All of them are intensifiers. All of them are on the move. All of them are decisive. The verbs are he rose, he departed, he went, he prayed. Here is Jesus taking some initiative to have a real goal. Maybe you want to do this right now in your own heart. To set a real goal to have fellowship with God on a daily basis this week. It takes a real decisive action. It's got to be more than just wishing that you could be close to God or wanting to grow as a Christian. It is you actually stepping into that. It is you doing that. God has actually given you a mind and a heart and a willpower, and I'm challenging you this morning by the example of Jesus to set your mind and heart on spending time with God and stop making excuses. Would you even now, would you even now commit to that in your own heart and mind? You've got to act. Let me give you something else. You'll see it <clears throat> in verse 35. That is, you've got to be disciplined, disciplined. It takes some actual self-control. Verse 35 tells us that rising very early in the morning rising very early in the morning. For those of you that are not morning people, you are night people, you're going to hate this. Rising early in the morning. I don't want to be legalistic about this, but morning is best. Here's what I say. To start your day with God's Word, to put the pressures of the day, the concerns that you have, the things that you know you've got to face, the people you have to deal with, the situations that are beyond you, the pressures of life, to be able to put those before God, asking God for help, asking God for strength, getting strength from the Bible, letting, letting God's Word come into your heart, nourish your soul, and to set the tone for the day. Ed, Andrew, Bronar, uh, Andrew Bonar, who wrote uh, the memoirs and remains of Robert Murray McShane, a biography of Robert Murray McShane, it's where we get our McShane reading plan. We wouldn't know it without Andrew Bonar. He's a great preacher in Scotland in about 200 years ago. Andrew Bonar said three things. <clears throat> Looking at this passage. Number one, don't speak to any person before you speak to Jesus. Don't speak to anybody. I would say, don't speak to anybody before you have a cup of coffee and speak to Jesus. If you don't drink coffee, don't speak to anyone before you speak to Jesus. Here's the second thing. Number two, don't do anything with your hands by way of work. Don't do anything with your hands before you've been on your knees before God. Don't do any work before you pray. Number three, don't read, the, he said, don't read the newspaper. Let me just bring that up to speed here. Don't look at the news on the iPad or your computer or on your phone. Don't look at Twitter. Don't look at Facebook before you read the Bible. D.L. Moody said, uh, you ought to see the face of God before you see the face of man. King David wrote in Psalm chapter 5, verse 3, he prayed, in the morning, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and I wait. Look, there is no law that your devotion can't be in the evening. There are a lot of people that function best like that. All I'm saying is God can empower you to put the pieces back together at the end of the day. I'm saying it's better, at least in my mind, to go into the day, and the example we have in Jesus, to go into the day prepared. Filled with the Spirit, asking God to give you empowerment, but it does take some discipline. You, you are disciplined about the things that you love. What did, this, what did the writer of Proverbs say? Proverbs 25, 28. 
A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Ask God to give you that, to give you the discipline. It takes discipline. Let me give you a third thing that you're going to need. You've got to have a plan. You've got to plan. You've got to plan. If you don't plan, for most of us, it's not going to happen. Verse 35, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. You don't get up before the sun does without some sort of plan. This doesn't happen by accident until you get about 65 or 70. You have to plan that. A lot of you sitting in here right now have a whole lot going on. Some of you got to get up so early for work or you've been out so your work has you so late. Or, or you got the kids, man, the kids, they got to be at school so early, you got to get them ready to get them to school that early. A lot of those things that, that are obstacles are actually good things. Those obstacles are good things, but they're obstacles that are keeping you from a great thing. So we need to find a way to plan. We need to find a way to take some action. We need to find a way for you to get off in the dark while it was still dark. Before the world is moving, for me, i got to have a dedicated place, a spot where I know I'm going to go. With your busy schedule, if we don't plan, what you, what you plan for is what you do. And because of the intense demands on your time and on your emotions and on your mental capacity, on what you are obligated to do, you need, because of those demands, you actually need the nourishing power of God's Word. You need your soul to be fed. You need the healing power of God's grace to wash over you early in the morning to prepare your heart so that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. With, with all that is in front of you in the day ahead, you've got to be disciplined. Let me give you a fourth thing. Number four, you've got to get up. You gotta actually get up. Physically get up out of the bed. What does the text say? Verse 35. And rising. You got up early in the morning. After a long, exhausting night, who knows how long those people stayed after midnight? And yet he got up. He actually physically got up out of bed. And truthfully, sometimes get up out of bed is the very first victory of the day. A lot of you were victorious today. You got up and came to church. You had a big victory today. That's a win. Getting up in the morning. I know that you like the snooze button. We all like the snooze button. But you know, the snooze button is a soul killer, right? Did you know that every time you hit the snooze button, an angel loses its wings? <laughs> Look, tell your children, I'm just kidding about that, okay? I know people that set their, I know people that set their clocks uh, 15 minutes before they have to get up just so they can hit this news button and get some extra sleep. They're cheating themselves. It's a mental game. Look, all I'm trying to say is, really what I want to say is that we need to want to spend time with Jesus more than we want to sleep. We need to want the 30 minutes with the Lord more than with the 30 minutes of sleep. And that, that's a difficult thing to do, especially when you're pressed like Jesus is pressed here late in the night, early in the morning. We live in a culture that when you start thinking about what is a healthy lifestyle, and oftentimes people want to press you to find a balanced lifestyle. I just want to say, balance is an illusion. The only people that have balance are on Instagram. And they had to take three or four shots at it. There's not any balance. There is only you pursuing a relationship with the living God. You, you desiring holiness and being close to God. And to get that, I think you're going to have to get up. What did the writer of Proverbs say in Proverbs 24, 33 and 34? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a robber and your want like an armed man. I don't want you... 
I don't want you spiritually poor. I want you spiritually fed. I want you strong. I want to be strong and ready. Something else you got to have. You got to have focus. Got to have focus. Verse 35 rising very early in the morning while it's still dark he departed he went out to a desolate place yours might say solitary place a wilderness type he went where nobody else was brothers and sisters to the best of your ability find a way even if it's for just a half an hour to be inaccessible fight the temptation to have your phone with you. If your phone's like mine, everything happens on my phone. I'm much more better on the phone than I even am on the computer. We really don't even know how to use the computer. I can use the phone. Everything goes to the phone. And if that phone is there, then I am completely accessible. And if it's buzzing while I'm reading the Bible, then I am distracted. I, personally, I have to, during my time of reading the Bible, I have to put it aside. Think about it now. Just for half an hour so you can sit there and, and read a few chapters in the Bible and think about what does the Bible say, what does God say to my heart to meditate on that and think about it. To, to be able to have some, some, some fellowship with God and think through some of the ways in your life that need some changing and the power that you need from God to have your soul mended and healed, to grow, to, to be made joyful by your own fellowship with God. Here is God the Son meeting exclusively with God the Father. It's almost impossible to do if the kids are up, TV's on, and the day has started. It's almost impossible to do if you're, I think it's impossible to do if you're driving into work and you're listening, let's say, on a dwell app. That's a good thing to do. You should probably be listening to the Bible while you're driving in Charlotte. That's really good. Keep you from saying cuss words, maybe. That's a good thing to do. I wouldn't let that be because we're distracted. I wouldn't let that be the sum total of your devotional life when you are spending time focused, thinking about, as modeled by the Lord Jesus right here in this passage with God the Father. And once you get there, you've got to, here's another you've got to, you've got to, you've got to pray. You've got to pray. See what he did there in verse 35, went off solitary place early in the morning, and at the very end of verse 35, he actually prayed. Three times in Mark, we find Jesus praying here. We find him in Mark chapter 6 before he walked on the water and scared the disciples. They thought it was a ghost. He prayed there. And then in Mark chapter 14 in the Garden of Gethsemane, God the Son speaking to God the Father. What are the ways you can pray? A lot of you know the acronyms. I'll give you uh, just a couple. One is uh, the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. If you don't know this, it would be worth writing down and praying through it. ACTS, A is for adoration. Tell God that you love Him. Tell God why you love God. C is for confession. We confess our sins to God. We do this on Sundays. Confess our sins to God. We confess His grace and forgiveness. We confess the same thing that God thinks about our sin, and we confess the grace that we have at the cross of Jesus. The T is for thanksgiving. We thank God for His constant provision. There are thousands of things that you right now could thank God for. The S is for supplication. That is to say, that's when we ask God for things. We ask Him to intervene. We ask Him to help. We ask Him to do what we can't do. If that's too much for you, then just do it in concentric circles. Concentric circles. So everybody in your house, house you live in, pray for them. Pray for yourself, pray for them. You don't have anybody in your house, you pray for yourself. Then draw the circle outside of your house. Think about the close friends and the people you work with and their needs and pray for them. Put that circle a little wider. Bring it out here to the church. Pray for me. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the life of this church. And keep drawing the circle wider. Pray for the treats that are going on the mission field. Pray for those that you see as the circles go further. If, if that's too much, then just take a notebook and write down names and situations. And you can see them and pray for them. And ask God and tell God and confess to God and praise God and thank God and be with God. 
You've got to pray. I'll give you another to consider. You've got to say no. You've got to say no. Verse 36 and 37, they found him. Simon found him. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. That word search, they were hunting for him. Somebody go to the synagogue, somebody go to the marketplace, look for him. Where could he be? They're, they're looking all over for him. Verse 37, they found him and they said to him, everybody's looking for you. The crowds are back. People need to be healed. Demons need to be cast out. We need to get back over there. That there's pressure. When you carve out a moment, a few moments with God, there are pressures that push on you that are good and real pressures. Pressures that maybe you could do and actually help. And they create in us this fear of missing out, this fear of missed opportunities. My days start early, mostly because the people in my world start early. And I, if the phone is close, I can actually, I can hear it buzzing. I know there's some conversation going on, and, and I want to be in it. I have this fear of, of missing, missing opportunities. Look, for you to carve out some time with God, something really good, but maybe not great, is going to have to be postponed or pushed to the side or rescheduled. Why, why am I pushing so hard on this? Because, brothers and sisters, we are, in spirit, we are in a spiritual war. Absolute spiritual warfare. And in order for you to be, you are an adopted son or daughter, certainly, of God. You also have been enlisted in this army of fighting a spiritual battle. And for an army to fight well... That army must be well-fed and fully equipped. And life in Jesus is the life we need. We need time with God. Let me see if I can just take this second point and put it on just as a way to end. Number two, we need clear gospel focus. Clear gospel focus. Here's what I mean. Verse 37, they find him. And they, what they say is, we, we have momentum, Jesus. All the people are looking for you. Folks have been healed. There is great thing. They're going on. Everybody in Capernaum knows about you. They've told their friends out in the outer skirts of Galilee, they're coming in to be healed. Your popularity is skyrocketing. And, and look what Jesus says. In the crowd, verse 38, look what he says. It's not the crowd I want, it's not the spectacular, it's not the popularity, it's not even the healing. Verse 38, and he said to them, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And they went, they started preaching and casting out demons. Now look, I, I think we have to... I think we have to fight against what is popular. It's so easy to jump on what is popular and what is persuasive and what's going to keep the crowd. Mark Dever said, um, Mark Dever said that what is popular can become normal and then what is normal actually becomes right. We've seen that in our society. What, what becomes popular becomes normal. And if you don't normalize it, then it's right. When we become so sensitive to those around us that we end up being insensitive to God, then we actually have missed the entire point. Yes, there are people back in Capernaum that need to be healed. And here in verse 38, Jesus gives the first corrective to the disciples. Look what he says. This is what I came for, verse 38. Let's go to the next towns. Let's preach there. That's why I came out. I came to proclaim the saving message of the gospel. What is the saving message of the gospel? To proclaim the kingdom of God is here and that kingdom is in a person. 
that Jesus himself came to reveal the message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone. The gospel which is by him, about him, and for him. Years later from all of this, the Apostle Paul will pick it up and condense it for us and explain it almost like a creed. This is what he says. Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether it's thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things are created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He's the head of the body, which is the church. He's the beginning. He, he's the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be made preeminent, most important. You see, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, either on earth or in heaven. And he's made peace by the blood of his cross. That's what I want you to have. The reconciling, soul-strengthening peace of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, life with Christ is the life we need. We need time with God, and we need gospel focus. This morning, as I bring the time of sermon, uh, the sermon down to a close and pray, I want you to commit your life, maybe quietly where you are, that this week you'll pick it up again, time with God, that this week your life has gospel focus. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in a little bit. That's what the Lord's Supper symbolizes for us, a cross-centered life. Let me pray, and then I'll explain the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would take the words that I've preached and especially your word that is written here before us by your spirit, ignite a fire in us. Make it possible that we might find the time and make the time, have the willpower and seek your face. God, help people here whose souls are dry and need you. May this day be a day that starts the beauty of of strong fellowship. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we are going to take the Lord's Supper. I'd like to explain a little bit about how we do that here for those of you that are guests with us today. <clears throat> here at Hickory Grove, we do so many things that are outreach oriented, hoping to see people come to Christ. One of those things, however, that is reserved only for those that are actually Christian is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for us a remembrance, a demonstration, a physical display of what Christ has done for us on the cross through his blood. For Christians, we believe that the physical front door opening of the church is through baptism. That is the outward display of what has happened on the inside of your life. Baptism doesn't save, it just displays the same thing is true for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper doesn't save, it just displays that you are living the crucified life. With that in mind, I would ask that if you are not a Christian here, or you're not sure of that, of that if you've not been baptized and joined the church, that you would just refrain and maybe have a conversation with one of the pastors afterwards. I would also ask that any of you here today that are members of this church and yet you sense that your life is marked with sin, you're living in some sort of lifestyle that is dishonoring the Lord, or you have a relationship with someone that is broken and not reconciled, may this be a reminder to you that that needs to be taken care of so that your fellowship with God would be even sweeter. 
As we take the Lord's Supper, you might want to make sure that you keep your children from taking it as a reminder to them that there will be a day when you give your life to Christ. It gives you an opportunity to share the gospel and what it means to actually be in Christ as opposed to not being in Christ. With that in mind, I would invite you to take the elements in hand. And with these elements, it's good to open the wafer first and maybe pull it out <clears throat> and put it to the side. Gently turn the cup over and open the top where the juice is. Put that to the side. And let's think. Paul said on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. The bread that will symbolize his body. The perfect body of Jesus. The sacrifice taking the wrath of God. Paul said that on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today we sang several songs that dealt with the blood of Christ. We sing often of the blood of Jesus. How do we do that? Blood has always symbolized life from the very beginning in the Bible. When blood was shed, there is the wrath of God or there is sins taken away. The whole sacrificial system of Judaism that was before Christianity, animals were sacrificed to show that the wages of sin is death. Blood was shed because of sin. When Christ came, His blood would be shed, but it would be shed differently. Not that it would have to be done over and over again. His blood would be shed in such a way that the wrath of God, like the angel of death passed over in Exodus, the wrath of God will pass over all of those under the blood of Jesus. With that in mind, Paul tells us that that same night, after supper, Jesus, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new, it is the new covenant which is given in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that as often as we drink the cup and eat the bread, we have preached the death of Jesus as an atoning work, the death of Jesus until he comes. We're going to sing another song. It's our final worship song and maybe a time where you want to come and pray and ask God to help you this week to be strengthened in the Lord. It may be a time where you want to come and talk to a pastor that will be down front to ask him to help you. It may be a time where you just want to sing to the Lord and thank him for the sacrifice of Jesus. With the taste in our mouth, let it strengthen our hearts. Join me as we pray, and we'll sing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of Jesus found in Mark chapter 1. We thank you for the atoning work of Jesus, symbolized by what we taste in our mouths right now. We thank you that you have sealed us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for men and women here that were not able to take the Lord's Supper today, that stand outside of fellowship. Holy Spirit of God, would you draw them in by the power of your word? Father, I pray for brothers and sisters in Christ that are caught in some sin, that you would remove it. Father, I pray that they would rejoice in the forgiveness that comes. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for grace. We thank you that we have fellowship with you. Lord, this is your church. Make us strong and useful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?